Yeah, like what you see, then give generously. All right, I like and that too. Absolutely, because you know, we have yes. to stay, stay on the air. We have right, to keep going. Right. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. It's two o'clock, two o'clock block with <laughs> John Davidan from HPU, history right, professor. Right. History hey, lens hey. we're talking about. Yes, yes. And we're trying to examine some. Right, but hang on a second. This, this giving issues. stuff. What's that old saying? Vote early, vote often. Yes. Ah. We're talking about giving. Give early, give off. Okay. okay. All right. No gerrymandering. <laughs> exactly. Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> so, so, John, right. you know, this is a very difficult topic to try to get a handle on, you know, what's happening now, yeah. what it reveals about what has happened before. As I said before the show, history professors know things that most, <laughs> most mortal people do not yeah. know. Well, they okay. can help elucidate I'll take that. I'll take that. things that seem so... Mm, so simple and wrong. Right, now right, they can right. try to make them right by looking at history. Yeah, now, but yeah. at least make them make them understandable. Make anyway. them understandable. I think that's the goal, right? We look through the lens of history and see if we can uh, make the situation at, in the present day look a little more normal. Well, uh, maybe so normal some surprises in twenty. Yeah, had some surprises. A lot of movement. But give people the comfort too, the because the, of course the current times are quite disturbing. I mean, people are anxious. You know, they're sweating this stuff, and it's, yeah, it should be sweated. It's, we, we live in interesting times, dare I say. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but so, yeah, so to look at the past and see the past as a place that can give us insights, give us understanding, give us lessons, um, it, that to me is very exciting. Okay, part but you agree with me, lessons which may or may not apply to our future. Well, it's up to humans to implement the lessons. This is why it's so important for historians to get out there and to talk about history, because Humans, if they don't know much about history, they're not going to know the lessons to learn, right? <laughs> Isn't there a song by that name? <laughs> history and geography. I don't know the song. You know, no, Are you going to sing now, Jay? Never mind. starting to frighten me here. <laughs> anyway, okay, so what, what, what does this bring to mind? You know, the revolution, if you will, that's too heavy a term. Uh, in the in the election right. of 2018, right, that's right. what does that bring to mind in the in the in the mind of a, an historian? Right. So, so what's interesting is that the election of 2018 showed some cracks in the Republican coalition, and it showed some gains for the Democratic Party because of those cracks in the coalition. So, when we think about the current political coalitions, we have to look at uh, the 1960s because that's when these coalitions reformed. Well, in the 1960s, the Democratic Party was the party of the South. The Democratic Party was the party of the working class. The Democratic Party was beginning to be the party of African Americans, although that was just a fairly new uh, 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 situation itself because, of course, African Americans up until the 1930s had voted solidly for Republican candidates. Because of Abraham Lincoln, yeah. he was the great emancipator. Reconstruction, all that. Exactly, South, yeah. exactly. So, when, so, so what we see is the, the political coalitions of the, the 1960s fell apart. The Republicans gained in the suburbs. They gained almost totally in the South, although it's, that's not completely true. I mean, the elections in the South are also very contested between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, they, they gained ground in suburbs. They gained ground in the southwestern part of the country. Um, so uh, this was a period when you and I were both alive, and, and uh, absolutely in the I last I from the seventies to the present day. So the question is big question: Why? What can we learn about that shift? Right. You know, in right. terms of causation. Right. Right. So, so in that particular shift. Uh, Richard Nixon made a concerted effort in the election of 1972 to try to win over what he called the silent majority. And these were suburban voters. So when you think about cities and you think about voting, the inner city of cities today is solidly Democratic. It's that uh, the first ring and especially the second ring of suburbs that has been Republican since Nixon made his appeal to the silent majority. And by saying silent majority, of course, there's always a vociferous or vocal minority. The vocal minority, this was the hippies, the leftists, the student protesters. Nixon was running against the hippies, the student protesters, uh, in 1972. And so, and he won big, actually. This was very effective for him. And the Republican Party has been 
running with a, a variation of this strategy for a long time, the party of law and order, the party of, you know, of limited government, the, you know, so on. Um, and, and so they've, they've been very successful at pigeonholing Democrats as leftists, liberals, kind of crazy people, and portraying themselves as the kind of solid, uh, you know, if you don't know who to vote for, if you or you have hesitations so about the why liberalism did that happen? of I agree. Of, I certainly of Democrats totally vote agree. Republican, right? I, I remember. Right. I'm right. a witness. Well, it was Nixon. Why? It what? was it was Nixon more than anything. Now Nixon had very good advisors who saw uh, Kevin Phillips was one of those advisors. Wrote uh, some important books on this. Who saw in the electorate that uh, changes in demographics for one thing. Uh, Keep snowbirds from the Midwest were moving to Arizona and New Mexico, and then they were staying there. They were older. Uh, they were on fixed incomes. They didn't want taxation, right? They wanted more of their own kind of personal freedom. Uh, they didn't have kids anymore, so they didn't care about the education system as much. Uh, so it was a recipe for Republicans to take over in the southwestern part of the country. Uh, so the demographics. So you had snowbirds going to the southwest, and you had an older, uh, uh, stable population there that wanted less government, less taxes, and I less... Get, I get two things out of that. Yeah. One is they were middle class who made some money. Yep. Okay? Wow. And the other, and so that they could think differently. They don't, they don't have to be active. They don't have to be Democrats anymore. All of a sudden, they're interested in protecting their stash. Yes, right. Okay? Right. And the yeah. second thing is they're getting older. Right. And, and more conservative by... Th that's right. And so that's we right. have yeah. a, an increase in life expectancy, no? No, that's right. That's right. So, but they still wanted a Social Security. Mm -hmm. They wanted sure. their retirement benefits. Sure. Of course, those were things they cared, cared very deeply about. And the Republicans didn't mess with that. Nixon didn't touch Social Security. He didn't touch their retirement. He was smart so, that way. So, yeah. So he didn't actually, uh, you know, he didn't alienate this group in any way. So, so that's... What, part of what's going on there um, in the suburbs and in the in the southwest part. Can, of the can you apply the same sort of rules into you know other previous historical shifts of the same nature? In other words, people moving around the country, the economic distribution changing, and the age distribution changing. Yeah, absolutely. Now the age distribution is more difficult, but if we so if we project back to the 1850s. Now I know that's a long way from okay, 1972. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're merely inquiring. Okay, we're going back. <laughs> Let's go back in the time machine. But so we're, we're going back to 1856, because 1856 is the year in which the Republican Party was founded. Now, you asked about demographic shifts, a migration. Well, what you have in the 1850s is a huge migration of Midwestern farmers into disputed territories, into Kansas, Nebraska, uh, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana. Michigan, Minnesota, uh, you have our pioneers coming into those areas, and they're mostly not coming from the south. A little bit in the southern part of Ohio, southern part of Indiana, southern part of Illinois. Those are southerners. Other than that, these are mostly northerners who are moving to the west. Mm. These northerners are predisposed to be more anti-slavery than they are pro-slavery mm. by the 1850s. Mm -hmm. And they start a movement. It's called the Free Soil Movement. Mm -hmm. They found a political party called the Free Soil Political Party. And this political party becomes the uh, kind of the basis for gathering around the issue of anti-slavery. And so the party develops around that. And then Free Soil is not enough because many abolitionists, uh, they have their own political party called the Liberty Party. That party is the party of New England. Uh, by and large, and, uh, and the abolitionists are a little bit suspicious of the free soilers because, because the free soilers are composed of people who don't like immigrants, who really don't like African Americans, uh, who, who not only want no slavery, but they don't want any African Americans at all. So the free soil party uh, is not enough, and so in the mid-1850s, then many of uh, anti-slavery folks move from the Free Soil Party into the Republican Party. And the Republican Party becomes, becomes an amalgam of Free Soil, of uh, the Abolitionist Liberty Party, even uh, the Whig Party, which is the Party of Economic Development, 
even a few know-nothings from the, the, American, uh, the American Party or the Native American Party join uh, the, the Republican Party. And the Republican Party then becomes the product of all those things. It becomes the party of economic development. During the Civil War, then you have uh, the Lincoln administration establishes the greenback for the first time they issue currency. They also establish the Transcontinental Railroad. They build that. They establish the Homestead Act, which allows uh, pioneers going out to the West uh, 60 acres, and you have to stay on the land for five years to get the land, but they pay nothing for it then. And so the party of economic development, the Republican Party becomes the party of abolitionism. And eventually, Lincoln and the Republicans go forward during the Civil War, at the end of the Civil War, and they abolish slavery. So you can it's see... It's not like a consolidation. Yeah. In other words, the little splinter group parties are disappearing into the, into the larger uh, Republican Party. Right. And, and, um, and, and that suggests, uh, and, and see if this is another thread that ah, affects we all these shifts. Yeah. 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 Um, that suggests leadership. Somebody was thinking this thought. Somebody was trying to cause the consolidation. Somebody was saying, follow me, boys. Well, follow me to the Republican sure. Party. Sure, you had, you had to have good leadership. And to, I, would, to, I suggest to, to you the that. leadership factor always, is always in play. It's in play now uh, in terms of who's joining what party. Yeah, but it's complicated. So the Republican Party, it's the party of Lincoln, right? Guess who founded it? Not, not Lincoln. Not Lincoln, no. Lincoln was a holdout. He stayed in the Whig Party right till the bitter end. He joined the Republican Party only after the, the Whig Party actually failed in his home state of Illinois. So yes, it definitely takes leadership. And, and so it takes a certain kind of leadership. You have to have organizational leadership. You have to have politically savvy leadership. And so there are, I mean, uh, Salmon Chase is deeply involved in the founding of the Republican Party. William Seward, they're both lawyers and they have political experience and organizational experience. So. Um, there's definitely leadership involved, but it's surrounded by issues. They're nothing if they don't have the issue of anti-slavery. Right. But then leaders and issues are connected. In other words, if I want to do consolidation, I have to figure out what appeals to people. Yes. I have to exactly. pick my issues. I have exactly. to run with the position. Exactly. I learned everything I need to know from Veep, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Veep tells me everything about okay. how you run a political party. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so issues are always important, uh, and they are, they're important in other places too, but this is how American political systems hang together and then get torn apart, is the issues of the days and, and good kind of political uh, uh, guidance or even manipulation uh, leads to these fundamental shifts in, in party. Now, there's You spoke about the Republican Party being consolidated right. during and after the Civil War. Right. And um, a moment ago, you spoke about Nixon, right. who, who, who a, a leader of sorts. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and he says, oh, we're going to make the Republican Party on the side of the suburbanites, the right. ones with some money, That's some right. age. Yes. Um, and we are going to try to connect that with them and, and distance ourselves from the activists and the young liberals. Yes, right. right. Okay, so right. <clears throat> it wasn't that different, was it, than the party you described as the Republican parties in the middle of the 19th century? Oh, it's well, business. Right, right. But, but so, okay, so the Republican Party of the mid-19th century, for one thing, it's a solidly northern party. Lincoln is not even on the ballot in most southern states. Wow. Yeah. It's a sectional party. Yeah. And by this time, so is the Democratic Party. Yeah. And this is, so this is, this, this sectional uh, party organization lasts until the 1890s. You figure from 1856 till 18, that's 40 years when Americans voted almost completely on where they lived, what part of country, the country they lived in. Uh, so that's a huge issue for that time. The Republican Party today is not a, it's not a sectional party, at no, least at this point. It's national for sure. Yeah, it's yeah. a national party. So, um, so you have a very big difference there. The Republican Party has continued to value the idea that Lincoln put forward that the worth of an individual depends on how hard that individual works and that that individual can raise him or herself up and you know, build themselves up from poverty and become anything they want to be, right? This kind of the ideology of the self-made man is really, it's both parties, but it's more Republican than it is Democrat. Yeah, but the dark side of the Republican view today is, 
if he doesn't choose to raise himself up, that's his problem. Right, right. And that's, this is a product of another time that we, you know, we'll probably talk more about this later. But, of course, there is a time in the late 19th century when this idea that people are connected to uh, their own initiative and their own, uh, uh, their own kind of uh, work habits and everything, and, and the individual can make it happen no matter what the odds, this idea is really challenged in the early 20th century by what we call the progressives. And the progressives are actually both Republicans. They're probably more Republicans than Democrats. People like Jane Addams, whose father uh, was a solid Republican and had letter, a letter from Abraham Lincoln in his house that he had framed. Wow. Uh, so, so this idea that the individual can raise him or herself up is an idea that sticks in American politics. It doesn't necessarily uh, just stick with the, the Republican Party. And there are Republicans who deny this because Jane Adams argues, look, it's not just about uh, your own initiative. It's about where you live. It's about how much food you have. It's about whether your employer mistreats you. So the progressive movement was all about, look, it's, it's about these environmental circumstances that you grew up in, that you live in. And, and that really uh, shapes to a great extent how successful you're going to be. Well, you know, it sounds to me like um, it's always dynamic. It's always changing. You can't really say that, that anything that happened along the way is, uh, except by nomenclature, which nomenclature is only nomenclature. Right. Um, that under the hood, things were always changing. Yes. And if yeah. you say that about the 19th century and, uh, and the first, uh, you know, I don't know, 60 years or, or more of the 20th century, yeah. Yeah. Uh, then you have to say it about now. Yes. And the only difference would yes. be now it moves even faster because of communications and uh, transportation. I'm not so sure about if that. If I have though. social media <laughs> and I can, I can do Twitter to 327 million Americans, all in the same yeah, moment, yeah, yeah, I yeah. can have an effect on things it's, more than they could in 1850. It's, it's, that's true, that's true, but, but, I, but the way that political coalitions cohere around particular issues, I still think takes quite some time to either succeed with those coalitions or to unlock those coalitions and begin to pick apart those coalitions. So, so in the present day politics then, uh, what has happened is Trump has led the Republican Party in a radically new direction, right? It's anti-immigrant now. It's kind of insular nationalist. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's against globalism, right? He's criticized and made fun of globalism in a variety of forms. So it's not necessarily free trade anymore. And so uh, I think there are a lot of confused Republicans out there, actually, who think that, well, uh, maybe because I'm a Republican, I still like Donald Trump, but I'm not quite sure about the issues anymore. I think Trump has really muddied the water for the Republican Party, which had a very sort of, uh, from the 70s to at least the early 2000s, had a pretty clear idea of what they stood for. Uh, you know, Lincoln's idea of freedom, only economic freedom. The freedom to fail, the freedom to not have, to, to have limited government and government staying out of business and the freedom to trade worldwide, right, where these were kind of the, the main themes of the Republican Party. Trump, I think in some ways it inadvertently, is now beginning to pick apart some of that. He seems to be an isolationist. He's willing to put in place tariffs. And Republicans are following him, but how long and how far will they follow him? I'm just not convinced that the Republican Party can uh, relabel itself in such a dramatic way and actually not lose a lot of voters, uh, not have people beginning to shave off. And I think that's part of my point about the 2018 election and the current election environment is uh, there's not only new, new demographics in, in the Southwest with a, a rapidly growing Hispanic population, but there's also people who are saying, you know, I was a Republican, but I'm not very excited about where the party's going. Right that's now. another factor. Yeah. The, the variation between the historic you know, conventional mm, issues and position of the party versus what people are saying right. for the party, That's about right. the party That's now. Exactly. And I agree exactly. certainly that it's a huge, a huge difference now. Yeah. Delta yeah. factor is huge. And That's right. The problem is, the pro I'm going to tell you something you didn't know, John. 
Not everybody Jay. understands history. <laughs> In fact, most people don't right. understand history. That's true. So they don't see the Delta factor. They don't right. realize right. that it wasn't too many years ago the Republican Party right. was really different no, than that's the way right. it is now. That's exactly right. So, yeah, so the shifts are really hard to understand. And, and uh, I mean, they're not hard to understand if you map them out and you study them. But if you're not interested in studying them and uh, you really have no idea of what they are, for one thing, and what they represent to the, kind of the larger picture, picture of American politics, then it's very difficult. Okay, now, now yeah. I always like to ask the question right. you hate. Historians hate <laughs> to make predictions what, what about like the saying? future. Okay, okay. This always makes them nervous. Okay. You can watch John's face twitch. I'm really scared. Twitch. Oh, yeah. I ask him, so... <laughs> <laughs> what does this teach us going forward? Right. We have a, a total dynamic. It, it sort of changes depending on what, how many hamburgers he had for breakfast. Right. Right. And so where is this all going? Is right. that Delta factor going to be bigger? Are people going to leave the Republican Party? Are going to join the Democratic well, Party or vice versa? Yeah. Uh, you I mean, know, I, everything is in play. Yeah, it's, it's, well, there's, there's cert it's, we're certainly at a fungible moment. That's absolutely true. I, I think the Republican Party actually is in danger of splits. They're, they seem to be holding together right now, but I think Mitt Romney is still at the back of his mind considering a run against Trump. I think he, you know, he said uh, at the new year, he said Trump has failed the test of leadership. Uh, so how long can Trump kind of keep these other people in line uh, with kind of fear and intimidation, which is his main game? I'm not sure about it. I think, uh, I think uh, so I predicted in the 2016 election that there would be a split. And true enough, Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney almost ran as an independent. So it almost happened. But it's still there, the, the, the possibility of the Republican Party splitting over issue, issues that Trump has raised, especially well, over should. free trade and, should. and the role of government. I mean, you know, Trump has, he can say whatever he wants about limited government and free trade, but he has done damage to the Republican brand in those in those regards. So how would you see that split happening? Which, which, what are the two factions? Let's assume there are two. Yeah, yeah. So there could be more, but let's assume sure, there are two. Sure, sure. Well, I, I suppose a, a sort of a, a Bush, as in you know, B Bush Sr. and Bush Jr. and Romney faction that, that would like to go back to the Republican Party as a, as a party of immigrants, not an anti-immigrant party, but a party of uh, in favor of immigrants, and but still security, of course, but which is not explicitly anti-immigrant because there's to me there's grave danger in that because you know that we're a country of immigrants, and uh, if 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 there's really not a national security crisis at the border, which there is not, then how can you sustain this anti-immigrant stuff when there's not you know we don't have hundreds of thousands or millions of immigrants coming into our into our land like, like Europe had in, the, you know, in 2015 with that great migration from the Middle East, from Syria. So we don't have a situation like that. And so to me, that's one issue where the Republicans party, Republican Party might want to rethink uh, post-Trump or maybe even in the 2020 election, um, the, the issue of, of free trade, okay? Now Trump has really kind of dabbled in, in tariffs but he's made it very clear that he doesn't like uh, American globalism, he withdrew troops from Syria in the face of firm opposition from the war hawks and the Republican Party. Um, so, so there are some issues there, and, and even uh, Mitch McConnell has criticized this withdrawal uh, from Syria. So there's two issues, American uh, trade, that's three issues actually, immigration, American trade, and then American kind of military and global preeminence in the world. Trump is doing damage to those things. Other Republicans think, hmm, uh, we, we don't like this. Uh, so, we're going to criticize Trump for that. But so they it's haven't, a global group. You got a global group. It could be. It could be a kind of global group. Well, yeah. Global group. All those things you mentioned are all sort of global awareness. That's true. Transnational, okay. yeah. Okay, now the other group, the ones that's left behind right, when this, right. this happens, right. they're the anti global group, right? Is that that's well, a division it's, it's you not, see? It's not that simple, but, but there's certainly a group. That is, uh, they're concerned about their own living, right? They're greatly concerned. And so, so you saw last week Trump actually, uh, uh, Trump announced he was going to run against Obamacare, right? He was going to try to get rid of Obamacare. And then this week, apparently, 
<laughs> no support he, for that. He, he reversed it. No support because for that. Uh, he finally fi figured out that he's you know uh, he he can't change gravity. Right? Uh, there's no there's no support for that whatsoever, and that would be that would doom Trump immediately. So uh, so he backed off on that. So so people so people who voted for Trump are very concerned about their small towns and their livelihoods. They see a way of life dying, um, and th so so they're insular. So they're insular, like like Trump is arguing. Well, are, they're not, they're are they going to leave with the globalists, or are they going to stay? No, I mean, no, they'll stay way. because they're insular. They're not globalists. They don't understand this, right? They, 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 get, they, they probably haven't hurt. traveled much. Uh, they're they're resentful that that free trade has brought all of this business to China, and maybe they lost a job at Got a it. factory in their hometown. Yeah, and got it, got and it. so so there's there's going to be this anti-globalist constituency uh, going forward. And does this pull the Republican Party apart? Okay, let's assume it gets pulled apart. Yeah. Just for this discussion. It's a very delicious <laughs> discussion. <laughs> Jay. What happens? Do we have two parties, Republican one, Republican two? Uh, do we have the Republicans, uh, the global Republicans joining the Democrats? Yeah. Uh, it sounds like it's, again, in play. Right, But right. what happens... Now, when you, when you look at, you know, all of American history right. and you try to figure out what, what, what these factors yeah, can do, right, right, right. are we going to see new names? Are we see the Whigs again? Uh, you know, I, the I don't know. I mean, back? here's the thing is, uh, the last time we had a major development of a new political party, of a, a major party, the Republican Party, it was an issue which eventually tore the country apart. I don't see that issue on the horizon. I don't see that there's an issue that can tear the country apart, save for maybe if Donald Trump tries to abrogate the 2020 elections, or if he, act, he does ab abrogate. get rid of the elections, just say, hey, we're or not going to have elections. Yeah. So, so there, there's an outside chance that there could be this kind of transformative event if Trump acts uh, like a tyrant, I mean, like really like a tyrant, like a dictator. If he tries to become a dictator, then I think that could be the transformative moment that destroys the Republican Party. Save maybe that, the Republic, too. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. But, but I definitely think it could destroy the Republican Party. In which case, what? The party implodes but, and but, everybody's running for other parties. Yeah, I mean, I think there would certainly be the, the Mitt Romney faction would say, hey, hey, come, come be with us. We, we don't like dictatorship, but we like limited government. We want global trade. You know, we, these issues that so... And he comes up with another name. Well, maybe the new Republican Party, or maybe it's just the Republican Party, and Trump leaves the Republican Party because you know Trump has always been about Trump. If they so leave him behind. They maybe leave him maybe behind. if let's say Trump loses the election in 2020, maybe Trump says, "I've had it. I'm pissed off at the Republican Party. I'm going to form the Trump Party." Yeah, and that could happen. And, and, and that base stays well. That'll immediately cause but a the huge new Republicans, rift in the, the global aware Republicans, right. they 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 carry the Republican right, Party. That's right. So one minute left, John. Right. You haven't mentioned the Democratic Party, which has its That's own true. schism going on. Yeah. And, and how does that play in right. all of this? Right. The, the thing is, the Democratic Party is not in the same situation as the Republican Party, because uh, when you look at the Democrats from the left wing to the center to the more conservative side, a lot of conservative Democrats became Republicans in the last 40 years. So that part of the party is not a concern because they're not, they're not actually in the party. And, and the, the thing is, the Democratic Party has already identified three issues that they're going to run on. They're going to run on the issue of health care. They're going to run on the issue of, of in, inequity, of you know, growing inequity between rich and poor. And uh, what was the third one? They're going to run on, uh, I think, the, the tax scam. Uh, they're going to you know, try to get rid of that. But so. So, no, I'm sorry, the third one is the elections and democracy. Mm, Those right. are such big tent issues. Who can disagree with, with getting our democracy right? Who's going to disagree with, with uh, supporting health care, with, you know, making, uh, protecting Obamacare and ensuring that people have health care, right? Who's going to disagree with, well, there might be some people who disagree with the argument that we need to uh, reduce inequality, but... Very few in the, in the Democrat. I don't think anybody in the Democratic Party is going to argue against that. So, so in other words, the Democratic Party is not ready for splits, actually. The Democratic Party is quite unified, and I think Trump helped to unify it by clarifying uh, through opposition what the Democrats stand for. So he's actually 
helping the Democrats define themselves. I think so. And they and, and creating a force in the Democrats uh, that will so, that will take so his base away. Typically, typically, somebody in the Republican Party, if they see the Democrats really succeeding on the issue of health care, would go, oh, let's get our own health care bill out there, right? Yeah. Trump is trying to destroy health care. He doesn't understand this. Um, typically, you would see somebody in the Republican Party saying, hey, we need to grab a hold of this democracy issue, and actually, we need to pointed in our own direction. It's not happening in the Republican Party. So they're, they're losing out on some of these issues. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, what a fascinating yeah. discussion. <laughs> John David and HBU history professor, history lens. It all looks different from the vantage oh, of history. Great to be here. <laughs> Thank all you, right. John. You great bet. to have you. Aloha. <laughs>